Book One, Chapter Seven of Cecilia. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nikki Sullivan. Cecilia, Memoirs of an Heiress by Fanny Burney, Book One, Chapter Seven. Several days passed on in nearly the same manner. The mornings were all spent in gossiping, shopping, and dressing, and the evenings were regularly appropriated to public places or large parties of company. Meanwhile, Mr. Arnott lived almost entirely in Portman Square. He slept, indeed, in his own lodgings, but he boarded wholly with Mr. Harrell, whose house he never for a moment quitted till night, except to attend Celia and his sister in their visitings and rambles. Mr. Arnott was a man of unexceptionable character, and of a disposition mild, serious, and benignant. His principles and blameless conduct obtained the universal esteem of the world, but his manners, which were rather too precise, joined to an uncommon gravity of countenance and demeanour, made his society rather permitted as a duty than sought as a pleasure. The charms of Cecilia had forcibly, suddenly, and deeply penetrated his heart. He only lived in her presence. Away from her he hardly existed. The emotions she excited were rather those of adoration than love, for he gazed upon beauty till he thought her more than human, and hung upon her accents till all speech seemed impertinent to him but her own. Yet so much were his expectations of success that not even to his own sister did he hint at the situation of his heart. Happy in an easy access to her, he contented himself with seeing, hearing, and watching her, beyond which bounds he formed not any plan, and scarce indulged any hope. Sir Robert Floyer, too, was a frequent visitor in Portman Square, where he dined almost daily. Cecilia was chagrined at seeing so much of him, and provoked to find herself almost constantly the object of his unrestrained examination. She was, however, far more seriously concerned for Mrs. Harrel when she discovered that this favorite friend of her husband was an unprincipled spendthrift, an extravagant gamester, for as he was the inseparable companion of Mr. Harrel, she dreaded the consequence both of his influence and his example. She too saw, with an amazement that daily increased, the fatigue yet fascination of a life of pleasure. Mr. Harrell seemed to consider his own house merely as a hotel, where at any hour of the night he might disturb the family to claim admittance, where letters and messages might be left for him, where he dined when no other dinner was offered him, and where, when he made an appointment, he was to be met with. His lady, too, though more at home, was not therefore more solitary. Her acquaintance were numerous, expensive and idle, and every moment not actually spent in company was scrupulously devoted to making arrangements for that purpose. In a short time Cecilia, who every day had hoped that the next would afford her greater satisfaction, but who every day found the present no better than the former, began to grow weary of eternally running the same ground, and to sicken at the irksome repetition of unremitting yet uninteresting dissipation. She saw nobody she wished to see, as she had met with nobody for whom she could care. For though sometimes those with whom she mixed appeared to be amiable, she knew that their manners, like their persons, were in their best array, and therefore she had too much understanding to judge decisively of their characters. But what chiefly dampened her hopes of forming a friendship with any of the new acquaintance to whom she was introduced, was the observation she herself made how ill the coldness of their hearts accorded with the warmth of their professions. Upon every first meeting the civilities which were shown her flattered her into believing she had excited a partiality that very little time would ripen into affection. The next meeting commonly confirmed the expectation, but the third and every future one regularly destroyed it. She found that time added nothing to their fondness, nor intimacy to their sincerity that the interest in her welfare, which appeared to be taken at first sight, 
seldom, with whatever reason, increased, and often without any abated, that the distinction she at first met with was no effusion of kindness, but of curiosity, which is scarcely sooner gratified than satisfied, and that those who lived always the life into which she had only lately been initiated were as much harassed with it as herself, though less spirited to relinquish, and more helpless to better it, and that they coveted nothing but which was new, because they had experienced the insufficiency of whatever was familiar. She began now to regret the loss she sustained in quitting the neighbourhood, and being deprived of the conversation of Mr. Monckton, and yet more earnestly to miss the affection and sigh for the society of Mrs. Charlton, the lady with whom she had long and happily resided in Bury. For she was soon compelled to give up all expectation of renewing the felicity of her earlier years, by being restored to the friendship of Mrs. Harrel, in whom she had mistaken the kindness of childish intimacy for the sincerity of chosen affection and though she saw her credulous error with mortification and displeasure, she regretted it with tenderness and sorrow. What at last, cried she, is human felicity? Who has tasted, and where is it to be found? If I, who to others seem marked out for even a partial possession of it, distinguished by fortune, caressed by the world, brought into the circle of high life, and surrounded with splendor, seek without finding it, yet losing, scarce know how I miss it. Ashamed upon reflection to believe that she was considered an object of envy by others, while repining and discontented herself, she determined not longer to be the only one insensible to the blessings within her reach, but by projecting and adopting some plan of conduct better suited to her taste and feelings than the frivolous insipidity of her present life, to make at once a more spirited and more worthy use of the affluence, freedom, and power which she possessed. A scheme of happiness at once rational and refined soon presented itself to her imagination. She proposed, for the basis of her plan, to become mistress of her own time, and with this view to drop all idle and uninteresting acquaintance, who, while they contribute neither to use nor pleasure, make so large a part of the community, that they may properly be called the underminers of existence. She could then show some taste and discernment in her choice of friends, and she resolved to select such only as by their piety could alleviate her mind, by their knowledge improve her understanding, and by their accomplishments and manners delight her affections. This regulation, if strictly adhered to, would soon relieve her from the fatigue of receiving many visitors, and therefore she might have all the leisure she could desire for the pursuit of her favorite studies, music and reading. Having thus, from her own estimation of human perfection, called whatever was noblest for her society, and from her own ideas of sedentary enjoyments, arranged the occupation of her hours of solitude, she felt fully satisfied with the portion of happiness which her scheme promised to herself, and began next to consider what was due from her to the world. And not without trembling did she then look forward to the claims which the splendid income she was soon to possess would call upon her to discharge. A strong sense of duty, a fervent desire to act right, were the ruling characteristics of her mind. Her affluence she therefore considered as a debt contracted with the poor, and her independence as a tie upon her liberality to pay it with interest. Many and various, then, soothing to her spirit and grateful to her sensibility, were the scenes which her fancy delineated. Now she supported an orphan, now softened the sorrows of a widow, now snatched from iniquity the feeble trembler at poverty, and now rescued from shame the proud struggler with disgrace. The prospect at once exalted her hopes, and enraptured her imagination. She regarded herself as an agent of charity, and already in idea anticipated the rewards of a good and faithful delegate. So animating are the designs in disinterested benevolence, so pure is the bliss of intellectual philanthropy. Not immediately, however, could this plan be put into execution. The society she meant to form could not be selected in the house of another, 
where, though to some she might show a preference, there were none she could reject, nor had she the power to indulge, according to the munificence of her wishes, the extensive generosity she projected. These purposes demanded a house of her own, and the unlimited disposal of her fortune, neither of which she could claim until she became of age. That period, however, was only eight months distant, and she pleased herself with the intention of meliorating her plan in the meantime, and preparing to put it in practice. But though, in common with all the race of still expecting man, she looked for that happiness in the time to come which the present failed to afford, she had yet the spirit and good sense to determine upon making every effort in her power to render her immediate way of life more useful and contented. Her first wish, therefore, now, was to quit the house of Mr. Harrel, where she neither met with entertainment nor instruction, but was perpetually mortified by seeing the total indifference of the friend in whose society she had hoped for nothing but affection. The will of her uncle, though it obliged her while under age to live with one of her guardians, left her at liberty to change amongst them according to her wishes or convenience. She determined, therefore, to make a visit herself to each of them, to observe their manners and way of life, and then, to the best of her judgment, decide with which of them she could be most contented, resolving, however, not to hint at her intention till it was ripe for execution, and then honestly to confess the reasons of her retreat. She had acquainted them both of her journey to town the morning after her arrival. She was almost an entire stranger to each of them, as she had not seen Mr. Briggs since she was nine years old, nor Mr. Delville within the time she could remember. The very morning that she had settled her proceedings for the arrangement on this new plan, she intended to request the use of Mrs. Harrell's carriage, and to make, without delay, the visits preparatory to her removal. But when she entered the parlour upon a summons to breakfast, her eagerness to quit that house gave way, for the present, to the pleasure she felt at the sight of Mr. Monckton, who was just arrived from Suffolk. She expressed her satisfaction in the most lively terms, and scrupled not to tell him she had not once been so much pleased since her journey to town except at her first meeting with Mrs. Harrell. Mr. Monckton, whose delight was infinitely superior to her own, and whose joy in seeing her was redoubled by the affectionate frankness of her reception, stifled his emotions to which her sight gave rise, and denying himself the solace of expressing his feelings, seemed much less charmed than herself at the meeting, and suffered no word nor look to escape him beyond what could be authorized by friendly civility. He then renewed with Mrs. Harrel an acquaintance which had been formed before her marriage, but which she had dropped when her distance from Cecilia, upon whose account alone he had thought it worth cultivation, made it no longer of use to him. She afterwards introduced her brother to him, and a conversation very interesting to both ladies took place, concerning several families with which they had been formerly connected, as well as the neighbourhood at large in which they had lately dwelt. Very little was the share taken by Mr. Arnott in these accounts and inquiries. The unaffected joy with which Cecilia had received Mr. Monckton had struck him with a sensation of envy as involuntary as it was painful. She did not, indeed, suspect that the gentleman's secret views, no reason for suspicion, was obvious, and his penetration sunk no deeper than appearances. He knew, too, that he was married, and therefore no jealousy occurred to him, but still she had smiled upon him and he felt that to purchase for himself a smile of so much sweetness, he would have sacrificed almost all else that was valuable to him upon earth. With an attention infinitely more accurate, Mr. Monckton had returned his observations. The uneasiness of his mind was apparent, and the anxious watchfulness of his eyes plainly manifested whence it arose. From the situation, indeed, which permitted an intercourse the most constant and unrestrained with such an object as Cecilia, nothing less could be expected, and therefore he considered his admiration as inevitable. All that remained to be discovered was the reception it had met from his fair enslaver. 
nor was he long in doubt he soon saw that she was not merely free from all passion herself but had so little watched mr arnott as to be unconscious she had inspired any yet was his own sincerity though apparently unmoved little less disturbed in secret than that of his rival he did not think him a formidable candidate but he dreaded the effects of intimacy fearing she might grow accustomed to his attentions and then become pleased with them he apprehended also that the influence of his sister and of mr harrel in his favour and though he had no difficulty to persuade himself that any offer he might now make would be rejected without hesitation he knew too well the insidious properties of perseverance to see him without inquietude situated so advantageously the morning was far advanced before he took leave yet he found no opportunity of discoursing with cecilia though he impatiently desired to examine into the state of her mind and to discover whether her london journey had added any fresh difficulties to the success of his long concerted scheme but as mrs harrel invited him to dinner he hoped the afternoon would be more propitious to his wishes cecilia too was eager to communicate to him her favour project and to receive his advice with respect to its execution she had long been used to his counsel and she was now more than ever solicitous to obtain it because she considered him as the only person in london who was interested in her welfare he saw however no promise of better success when he made his appearance at dinner-time for not only mr arnott was already arrived but sir robert floyer and he found cecilia so much the object of their mutual attention that he had still less chance than in the morning of speaking to her unheard yet was he not idle the sight of sir robert gave abundant employment to his penetration which was immediately at work to discover the motive of his visit but this with all sagacity was not easily decided for though the constant direction of his eyes towards cecilia proved at least that he was not insensible of her beauty his carelessness whether or not she was hurt by his examination the little pains he took to converse with her and the invariable insurance and negligence of his manners seemed strongly to demonstrate an indifference to the sentiments he inspired totally incompatible with the solicitude of affection in cecilia he had nothing to observe but what his knowledge of her character prepared him to expect a shame no less indignant than modest at the freedom with which she saw herself surveyed very little therefore was the satisfaction which this visit procured him for soon after dinner the ladies retired and as they had an early engagement for the evening the gentlemen received no summons to their tea-table but he contrived before they quitted the room to make an appointment for attending them the next morning to a rehearsal of a new serious opera he stayed not after their departure longer than decency required for too much in earnest was his present pursuit to fit him for such conversation as the house in cecilia's absence could afford him End of chapter seven recording by nikki sullivan chicago